This is John Honeycutt sharing with you a few things that I've learned and experienced in dealing with at-risk youth, uh, which in this presentation I call at promise. Uh, not an expression I came up with, but I love the expression nonetheless. Now there is a part one, and this is part two of a, uh, a presentation uh, along this line, and this part is specifically around strengths-based approach, which is uh, a set of precepts that I learned from a, a former colleague, uh, Kevin Powell. And so I'd like to share this with you, and here we'll kind of get into it. Uh, the first set of items are about relationships, and I went into quite a bit of detail on uh, part one about ways that I have found effective for me, which may be different than the ones that would be effective for you, but to build relationships both with the youth and uh, their parents or guardians or adults in their life, and to some extent the community around them. Uh, but positive youth relationships, I've found, uh, oddly enough, kids are very interested in shoes. I don't know why, but I, for me, I, I actually buy um, youth tennis shoes and wear them, and um, just that alone gives me some rapport. But having some knowledge about what uh, the young people are interested in, and here we've got Billy and Drake uh, shown, and kind of knowing who the artists are that they listen to and the influencers on YouTube and uh, other social media. With relationships, um, most teachers have probably experienced a kid that maybe even they've disciplined a lot in their classroom, see them at a, a public location like a Walmart with their parent and Honeycut, Honeycut, and that's a great opportunity to <laughs> affirm the kid, uh, at least in some way, uh, energetic perhaps, in my classroom and uh, to their parent, and that's, that's another wonderful way of building rapport. Uh, just being present at games or orchestra, concerts, uh, those kind of things, just being present and they see you and they know that um, you care. Uh, development of an optimistic attitude and the first slide here I I share this kind of physiological thing with my students every class not not every class period but at the beginning of the year with every new group of students I teach about uh, the frontal lobe and that uh, with um, until you reach about the age of 25 26 it's not fully developed and that's where risk assessment uh, comes from and so young person um, you don't think about the risks like you need to and will eventually so we talk just talk about that and but helping uh, young people develop a sense of tolerance for others uh, is important and then for you and I as professionals especially educators uh, when it when a young person has a bad day or uh, even gets in trouble, perhaps, allowing the next day to just be a restart. And I find that to be really helpful. And, and kids that uh, kids need that, uh, to be able to just be fresh uh, and uh, a restart. So this notion of uh, relapse optimism. And, and I want to share this one little, I'm going to call it a best practice. I learned this from my dad. He, he carried around Band-Aids in his wallet. And when a kid's kind of not feeling up to themselves at their best, uh, not an actual hurt, you can take a Band-Aid out and say, here, and put this on your elbow. And they go, that's not going to help. And you go, yeah, it might. And it, it's, uh, it's kind of comedic relief, but um, putting a, a Band-Aid on one's elbow uh, when... It's not even a physical ailment. Uh, anyway, Band-Aids, I'm sharing that with you, and my dad shared it with me, and I find it to be effective. Uh, a lot of young people, especially those that have come from, quote, unquote, the system, uh, haven't had the kind of practice of uh, solving problems 
that uh, youth in different circumstances have. And so the kind of the approach, and I, this came from when I was a business person, is fully listen, uh, repeat what you think they said, and sometimes you didn't hear them the way that they meant it. Uh, and so they can correct what they mean. And then acknowledge the emotion, brainstorm with them solutions, and initially you may need to come up with three or four possibilities and uh, let them kind of choose from that set. And after there's some practice um, done with this kind of approach, uh, the skill of solving problems uh, will be improved. And then if there's something that you committed to, make sure that uh, you follow through, please. Uh, the, a lot of at-risk slash at-promise youth uh, have learned, learned helplessness and kind of are the victim in things, uh, which, by the way, sometimes they are. Uh, but um, kind of a victim stance line of thinking. And so in these instances, uh, those of you that are teachers like I am and uh, people that are um, kind of paraprofessionals, we, we will do well of acknowledging it, but allowing uh, them to focus on some positive stuff about themselves uh, and so that it's control that they have of their world, not just helplessness. Um, something that we did with our uh, adoptive sons uh, was give them, instead of us buying the groceries for them, uh, they have a budget and they they spend up to the last dime of their budget uh, on groceries but they get to control uh, what they're gonna purchase for themselves and they cook for themselves which is really quite amazing for teen boys and uh, they we also bought them as absurd as it sounds we bought them each one of those mini fridges and it's enough uh, so you know college dorms have these and so it's enough for them to really keep their own stuff in their own place. And they still try and sneak things into our refrigerator, um, but that's a different story. <laughs> um, this next one, gratefulness. I've done this with high school students and with middle school students uh, where they actually write a thank you uh, to someone that's been important in their lives. And as an aside, I recently got a note like that that another teacher I work with um, had their students do. It was really wonderful to get it. Um, but people in my age group, we like handwritten stuff and as opposed to the text message only or the email. And young people are not really, they, they don't even know how to address an envelope. I'm not kidding. And so at one, uh, for a couple of years in a row, I had my high school students write a gratitude letter uh, to someone. They could pick it out. I didn't read their letter. And they just needed to bring the mailing address in. And I showed them how to address an envelope. And I put the stamp on there and they sent it off. And I think the results, the feedback they got must have been pretty powerful because uh, it was so powerful. I, I think that was the main thing that some of my students got out of my whole year's worth of science. Anyway, interests and talents. So um, I also had them write vision letters to themselves so they would... I had prompts like, what do you like best about yourself? What's something you knew you could try in the next three months you've never done? And so what's something that'll make you laugh when you read this and open it up? But also, what do you think you might be in five, 10 years or some things like that? And uh, we seal them up. And at first, when we did this, the very first time we did it, they taped up their thing to make sure I wasn't gonna open it up and read it, which of course I did not. And then they became more trusting and just kind of sealed it regularly. But uh, it was amazing when they saw the letter written to themselves, uh, this vision letter, and they realized, you know, three, four months has passed, and it helped them think in terms of, okay, there's going to be three, four months from now also, and maybe a year or two out. So vision letters are 
I think a powerful tool and then both of these next two things all teachers do this we look for um, opportunities for our students to be successful and kind of watch out for that one little success in a child that's struggling in other ways and just affirm that success and praise it and uh, that's very strengths-based thinking um, here's something I'm not good at there's one later that I'm pretty good at but reframing a deficit into a positive uh, into a strength it is hard uh, I pulled these out of uh, where did I get them from Brooks publishing uh, so it's down there in the fine print uh, of examples of reframing deficits as strengths and so when you see that uh, hyperactive kid at, at the Walmart and you're meeting their parents instead of like yeah really hyperactive how about zestful yeah that zestful child and um, many okay I, I'm gonna pretend as if I knew what aces was which I did like a couple years ago but just three or four days ago we had a presenter uh, that reminded me of aces uh, and these uh, it's really administered to adults not children but young people that have had um, these moments of trauma like divorce is a real common one uh, but violence in the home or de uh, some alcoholism or uh, addictions uh, that when there has been several of these in the child's life uh, the statistics shore up that uh, they've got more struggle as adults so there's some things we can do uh, as uh, mentors as teachers as mental health providers um, that we can we reframe uh, survival of those difficult things uh, into strengths uh, a sense of self um, empathy of others uh, the ability to cope and here's one uh, perseverance uh, that's an extracted word for strengths based out of Kevin's book uh, I'm going to frame it up sort of a slightly different way this is uh, a way that I do math now my uh, my daily work is not about right and wrong answers um, really it's about did you try and did you try your best and was your behavior good uh, because on tests which are about right and wrong for me um, that kind of separates out uh, the students that really know the content uh, versus those who don't quite know the content yet I use a I use an online free online open source uh, uh, math teaching tool called CK 12 and it also has science and other subjects but there's always 10 questions at the end of every lesson that the, the student has to answer and on the on the far right hand side here uh, this student um, actually all three of these answered 10 questions uh, but the one on the far right hand side answered really difficult questions correctly and when you get incorrect answers then they become successively less um, difficult so the student on the on the I said on the far right uh, the student on the far left uh, struggled a bit on this lesson uh, but all three of these students got the exact same grade they were all well behaved they all really focused and all tried so on their daily grade this was a 9 or 10 out of 10 um, so not just the outcomes and I think that's really important uh, in my math classes especially I make that uh, accentuate that that on your daily grades it's about participation and don't be afraid to be wrong uh, I celebrate wrong answers uh, it means that you're trying and when you get something wrong the next time you can get it right delayed gratification is something that uh, I've experienced uh, with those 400 students I talked about in part one at Platte Valley uh, as well as students that I've taught in kind of difficult economic circumstances delayed gratification is hard 
Uh, it's like if something presents itself to you, take it right now because it may not be there tomorrow. And so teaching that sense of future is not easy, but I think it's important. And uh, emotional management, and I, I pulled these this list uh, off of, I'm not sure where I got it, uh, journaling, exercise, reading, yoga. There's things that we can do in a classroom and things that we can encourage outside of a classroom that help with emotional management. And um, a couple of things that I, I learned from my wife, who's a, a, a licensed professional counselor, are some relaxation techniques that uh, I've taught my students. And uh, the students that read well, uh, I think have a great advantage on emotional management because they can kind of take a trip away from the realities of right now and go someplace else in, you know, in, inside the book. And uh, I wish that more young people read more often. On honesty, this is something that we really need to model and we need to celebrate. I had a student not too long ago that I asked a couple of questions to and uh, he knew that the right answer was X, but the truthful answer was Y. And he gave me the truthful answer and I go, we're good. I think that you understand. And uh, celebrating honesty, I mean, of course, sometimes you uh, regardless of honest or not, there needs to be a consequence or something to that effect. But uh, let's celebrate honesty and encourage it, notice it, and certainly model it. Then this slide and the next slide are on something that I found on Wikipedia about a year and a half, two years ago. It's called the Codex, uh, the Cognitive Bias Codex. And <laughs> It's, it's so huge uh, that I can't even show all of it, but here's a little extract of one part of this wheel. And I think there must be 200, I don't know, 200 different kinds of bias on this wheel, and they are um, organized uh, into categories. What should we remember? Too much information, not enough information. We need to act fast. And so two of them on what, what we should remember, the kinds of uh, biases on, on that wheel, one of them is prejudice and one of them is stereotypical bias. And they're right next to each other because they're so similar. But you and I have at least half a dozen on this wheel and being able to discern uh, when we have a bias or a prejudice, in this case, the ones displayed, um, becomes important to uh, it, it's good for critical thinking uh, and it's good for us to self-assess personal assets so this word asset uh, which is in Kevin's book uh, because of my uh, business uh, kind of background I, it, it was a little bit difficult for me to get my head around uh, the expression asset in terms of uh, strengths based approach. It's not talking about money. It's not talking about, you know, a, a building. It's really talking about the ability to uh, cope and solve problems, uh, get through the day, uh, both internally and kind of the assets that one has externally, uh, such as family uh, or a support system. So in, in this case, positive identity. Uh, that was kind of illustrated by you are worthy in part one and then the support uh, the young student that uh, I kind of had a signal that said I'm thinking about you in a positive way uh, so that was in that student's support system uh, a personal asset now in uh, the the book strengths based approach by uh, Dr. Powell uh, he lists 40 external assets I think I counted them I think it's 40 it may be 35 or 45 and they are um, articulated exceptionally well and it helped me understand what he meant uh, by personal assets the degree with which we can teach and reinforce recognize personal assets of our young people that are at risk helps transform them to uh, at promise Resiliency of problem solving, I've already mentioned problem solving, in my opinion, is 
not yet an area of strength for many youth. And so that's something we can help teach and model. Adaptive humor, on the other hand, is a strength of many, uh, and as opposed to maladaptive humor. And then just uh, internal motivation and drive. Not all, but a handful out of many uh, really have a lot of internal drive to be successful or to make it out of, uh, make it out of a situation. Uh, Pro-social, I, I, I find this easier to kind of think in terms of the opposite of antisocial. Uh, so, uh, in really, the word pro-social, I was first acquainted with it five years ago. I, I hadn't heard it before then, I don't think. Uh, but these are acts that uh, are for the purpose of benefiting others. But before we can really kind of get to pro-social stuff, like the actual pro-social stuff, uh, with at-risk youth uh, that we are holding to the at-promise hope, uh, we need to address the basic needs first, the, you know, food, clothing, shelter, and before we can get to the higher levels. Um, but once we do that, then we can have, you know, some opportunities for being part of something bigger than oneself. And in this case, uh, Eric, I'm so proud of this young man. He was the first one to receive uh, scholarship money out of uh, Cornerstone Crossroads Academy that I discussed in part one uh, of something that uh, was set up to help the new graduates. And not only did he uh, graduate from the school, but he became one of the chaperones on the uh, aspiration of courage. And I, I like this picture of he and I. A belonging model, teach, reinforce pro-social skills, and educate about the reciprocal nature of relationships as opposed to transactional. A lot of young people understandably, forgivably, and predictably, uh, you know, if I'll do this for you if you do the, that for me, as opposed to kind of, okay, it'll all come back around eventually. So I'm going to do something kind, an act of kindness. Um, and when we can get one of our at-promise youth to that point, uh, there's a great deal of pride that I think comes about with it, uh, pride in a good way. This slide, I'm not going to pretend at all that I know a lot about the subject. I just have been acquainted with the notion that uh, children kind of from birth through two years old when they have not had appropriate care, uh, there's uh, some issues that can develop, I'll use the word issues, uh, just late, uh, even into their toddler and uh, youthful through teenage and even into adulthood years. And that's hard to get through. Um, now, professional uh, counselors and psychiatrists and sociologists and people with ology after their name, I guess, uh, could tell you a lot more about this. I don't, but uh, the notion of being dependable, I understand that. Uh, being dependable, follow through. If you say you're going to do something, do it and establish that dependability. And I think after, it's not weeks and days, but after months, maybe even a couple of years, uh, you can be helpful in that way. Um, something that I learned from Kevin, uh, both it's in his book, articulated very well, but uh, he shared it uh, just kind of informally, uh, was the notion of allowing sadness to be a strength at times. And he also describes uh, the notion of anger, which is what kind of is manifest, sometimes comes from a place of loneliness or sadness or embarrassment some other kind of emotion and uh, kind of helping a young person to express something beneath the surface uh, can be really helpful and therapeutic um, in a, uh, you know, an informal way. Not, I'm not pretending to be a professional. 
Uh, Self-reflection, I love this picture of this student. This was a Crossroads student, and I don't know if there was self-reflection going on, but it sure looks like it to me. And so when we can help our young people uh, think in terms of benefiting others, that's good. In part one of this, I described a young man and his two boys that lived with Jennifer and I for two years, and we created something called Gleaming Glasses Gang. I think that's what we called it. And we, Jen and I felt that the boys needed to experience doing something kind uh, in a very obvious way. And so we got Windex and uh, mixed it, uh, kind of diluted it and a little bit of vinegar and diluted that and got some really clean cloths and went to uh, elderly facilities, uh, old folks' homes, if that's an expression I can use, and cleaned their glasses for them. And, I, and I'd kind of like someone to clean my glasses for me. Um, but the, uh, I don't know if it was that the residents really, really, really liked having their glasses cleaned or they just enjoyed seeing these, you know, nine, ten year old boys coming and visiting. And, uh, you know, but the boys got to experience this and they kind of liked it. And they, they would ask, when are we going to go again? Because they got a lot of positive, att <laughs> positive attention out of that. Uh, speaking of which, uh, the statistic of four to one, I don't know if it's, you know, like been researched, but the anecdote is for every one kind of scolding or discipline or consequence, try and find four. They don't have to be the same size of uh, affirmation, but kind of make it four to one. And this expression of bonus response cost interventions is really interesting. I, I had done this kind of naturally with uh, our two children that are now grown, James and Danielle, uh, when they were uh, children and teens, but kind of build the reward in that if you do this and we do that, um, at the end of that, we're going to go get to do this, uh, whereas the thing they want to do. And so uh, building in the reward as part of the process is, uh, it, that's what's bonus response cost intervention. That's a mouthful for me but a, a really wonderful concept. Okay, good character, con uh, uh, good character qualities in life goals. Uh, these are kind of hard to teach. Some of them have to be modeled and some of them can be put into place. Um, but a few of them can be taught, like money management, a big one. Uh, so these are good character traits, and if you and I had all of these things, you know, to uh, maximum, we'd be uh, pretty good characters, don't you think? And so our at promise youth being able to be exposed to that is important. Uh, intellectual development, normalizing differences is uh, crucial because each of us, you and I, and the other people listening to this video, we all have our own strengths and they are not the same. Same with youth. And we can collaborate on goals uh, about what do you envision for yourself in the future, you know, one, two, five years out. And we can have some discussions. Here's something that uh, I describe some things I don't know well and I don't do well. This is one I do very well. Uh, I make it safe to be wrong in my classrooms, especially in math. Um, and I, I dislike it when a student says, I don't know. Uh, I, I want them, I, and I go, I'm not asking what you know. I'm asking what you think or give it your best be guess try. And I celebrate getting wrong answers uh, if it's really a try. I, I'm so proud of a student when they'll speak out and they'll give it a shot. And uh, this encourages really learning, I think, uh, because in math, it's, it's pretty easy to cheat. And so I don't want my kids to cheat. I want them to be okay with getting something wrong 
And so that, anyway, that's my approach. You might have a different one. And uh, Normalized differences. Here's one that I'm going to highlight of my dad right here. He went by Bill, uh, but his real name was Vildridge Allard. Uh, what a great man, and I miss him dearly. He was an educator, a, life, a lifelong educator. And uh, there was a family that kind of lived on the quote-unquote wrong side of the tracks, uh, not affluent by any means. And uh, uh, some the boys that were part of that family, uh, sometimes they didn't have, you know, what, even what they needed uh, to go to school. But one of them uh, had wonderfully strong upper body strength and did not have use of his his legs and, and this was in junior high and dad uh, had the physical education teacher go purchase some house you know some chin-up bars uh, that were real sturdy and one of those punching bag kind of things and had a uh, the coach uh, integrate that into the the PE curriculum and so this boy that had previously been kind of dismissed all of a sudden he he was like the star of the show he could he could do uh, chin-ups like nobody's business you know uh, without stopping and the other boys that didn't have that kind of upper body strength uh, were amazed and so looking out for those in this case the literal strength um, but the figurative strengths in our students and helping kind of highlight those so that it's not just us that see them but others too uh, this photo uh, was featured in uh, the stigler newspaper uh, they came and uh, watched an event that we had where i, I put my older students my juniors uh, together with third and fourth graders where my students programmed some uh, TI calculators um, in, in this kind of robot thing and to draw robots on butcher block paper. So we used robots to draw robots and it was good for everybody. Uh, it was good for the young students to be able to look up to the older ones and it was good for my students to be able to mentor younger ones um, make learning novel and multi-sensory there's an acronym I just learned it I, when I was putting this together VACT uh, so visual auditory kinesthetic and tactile uh, so the degree with which we can um, make our learning opportunities multi-sensory and so I've done that I just didn't know it was called VACT so I am now smarter than I was and I've told you a few things I'm not great at. This one I'm really good at. I think people that are uh, teachers that were alternatively certified, maybe all have, maybe we all have this kind of strength, being able to make uh, our moments of learning applicable uh, about how they apply in real life. And uh, so if by chance you are a lifelong educator, not that you can't do this, but you might take advantage of a colleague uh, that's had business experience or been a laboratory scientist, that kind of thing, or, or something else, a bus, bus driver, um, a long haul driver, make things uh, applicable to real life. Here's some examples. Uh, I took uh, my chemistry students to a, a water, a testing lab that was nearby my biology students I had them find and identify leaves on trees that uh, were common to uh, the county that we lived in and so it was making a second grade assignment into a high school level assignment uh, with local uh, wild uh, trees and something that kind of tickles me is PayPal and Uber they use the very simple it doesn't sound simple but the equation of f of x equals mx plus b uh, so there's a drop uh, there's a drop charge and in this case there's a 35 cent fixed fee along with a percentage and along with miles driven and it's pre-algebra um, algebra one 
Then for the coordinate plane, those little vacuums that we use, those robot vacuums, uh, the way that they remember where to go is an XY coordinate plane. And Pac-Man and Ms. Pac-Man are on a coordinate plane. That's all. So teaching Y, uh, X and Y graphing. Uh, here's a great list of multiple intelligences. Um, I got this from uh, this image from Simply uh, psychology.org and I so I'm giving them credit I don't know if it's okay uh, anyway it, it's here uh, and so the eight different kinds of intelligences are listed and there's probably other lists also but I really liked this one um, I've had some students that were extremely good in nature one of my students was like an amazing coon hunter at night and so that's very clearly a naturalist. Uh, I had a student that was um, really a wonderful athlete and kind of struggled sometimes in other areas. Um, my son, James, uh, while he's a, actually a filmmaker for his job, he's, he's an amazing, to me anyway, linguist. He wouldn't give himself that credit. Um, so here they are kind of big so you can read them. Emotional intelligence. Uh, so, this is one of uh, this is one of the students I got uh, to meet. Uh, what a wonderful young man uh, on that uh, Aspirations of Courage tour, and uh, he had such a charm about him. You can even kind of see it in this uh, in this photograph. Uh, and emotional intelligence. Sometimes you can pose the question, like if if there's a kind of a struggle emotionally on a, on, a, on a moment, you know, will this be important a year from now? And most times the answer is no, not really. Um, hadn't thought of it that way. And we can teach about uh, thought stopping. Uh, my daughter introduced me to a book that I don't remember what it's called. It's something about gremlins, uh, you know, stop the gremlins in your head. A, r a really wonderful text that is about thought stopping, peaceful imagery, and positive self-talk. Uh, in uh, Dr. Powell's book, he, he doesn't have this diagram, but he speaks to emotional intelligence, awareness of one's own emotions, and then regulation of one's own, then awareness of others and regulations of others' emotions. And uh, it's uh, really rich content in that section. Uh, and then you and I, this is about you and I, youth professionals, teachers, counselors, uh, police officers, healthcare workers. We need to be strengths based uh, with ourselves. Jennifer and I practice this. Uh, she has a similar kind of role with young people as I do uh, as a teacher. She's a, an LPC, I think I, I mentioned that. So. Uh, we take care uh, of, of each other and ourselves. We spend time with each other after work and just kind of relax uh, and sometimes go on a walk with our dog uh, and we, we talk uh, and just kind of share. And uh, that's what we do. And, uh, you know, your way of doing self-care is going to be different than our way. But part of what we all need to do is to compartmentalize and separate ourselves from the difficulties we've encountered during the day and helping uh, our at-risk, at-promise youth and, uh, and focus a little bit on ourselves. And then be strengths-based with our college uh, colleagues and our college, I guess. Uh, and my current job, uh, the educators that I'm with, they're, they're magically good at this. There's just affirmations all over the place. Makes it for a nice place to work, even if a day's been kind of a struggle and hard. Um, and so I'm going to commit to getting better at that. Uh, then the, the last thing uh, that was in Kevin's book that's articulated well is uh, for us to continually monitor ourselves for a deficit approach. And I I fall into that sometimes. Uh, I, I go, that kid needs X, Y, Z. And I forget to focus on the strengths uh, equally as much, if not more so. 
Uh, love languages kind of helps me in that regard. And this third part, it's not going to take long, so just kind of stick with me. It's not a different video. What I have learned, uh, what I've learned is there really are many needs. I mean, there's way too many needs. Uh, I'm going to show you some quick statistics on this. So there are many needs. Too many, really. Here they are. Too many. But there's also a lot of a lot of us who care, and you and I do. Uh, there's others that also do. There's uh, three and a half million teachers, uh, two hundred thousand coaches, and similar to what I uh, earlier described with. Uh, the Upward Bound program, there's an estimated, I, did, I couldn't find a definitive number, but an estimated, in my estimation, about 6,000 um, professionals that help transition uh, young people from high school to college that are first generation. Uh, my wife is in this group, and then the good people that helped uh, facilitate our adoption of uh, Devin and Ryan. Uh, there's foster families. I haven't mentioned this, but my daughter is the one that firstly, uh, daughter Danielle, she's the one that firstly got us interested in thinking about adopting. Uh, she has an ad adoptive uh, brother and sister that are my <laughs> grandkids that I adore. And uh, so Danielle not only is uh, you know a foster, uh, well, adoptive parent now, um, uh, but she fostered, I think, 10 different children over the course of a decade. And uh, so she has encouraged other people like you and I. And then BBBS is Big Brothers and Sisters of America. I was a big brother when I was 19 and 20. And uh, here are some different ways to help. So if you are not a professional or not a paraprofessional, there are ways that you can get involved and help out on um, the strengths-based ways of getting our youth kind of into being productive and wonderfully successful in whatever, uh, however you de define success. So you can give of time. Uh, the job itself, uh, teachers and counselors, it's the job itself, giving time, volunteering, and at events, and your talent. So it could be that you play a musical instrument, you might have a hobby, you might be a painter, uh, your expertise in your job that has nothing to do with youth, but sharing that uh, in a classroom uh, or in another way, and sometimes just your joy. Uh, there's a lot of us, um, you, uh, that uh, just emanate, is that the right word? Emanate joy, radiate joy. And that's a talent, that's a strength of yours. And then treasure, giving money, but also there's other way to give treasure. Uh, there's pro bono work, um, there's goodwill, there's giving a discount on something. And then this last one, I'm gonna have fun with it. The triple T I learned uh, from when I worked with a company uh, about 15, 20 years ago, time, talent, and treasure. But this is evidence of time, talent, and treasure, our uh, aspirations of courage. There were 50 people that donated money, but there were many organizations uh, that donated time and talent. And if you don't want to do time, talent, and treasure, you can teach. But uh-oh, it has all those involved. <laughs> so that's my funny. Okay, that's my joke. But teach. And uh, we are better as a team, and I've learned that in multiple situations. Um, we're okay as individuals, but we can do more when we work together. And here is one for the type A personalities listening in. Listen and watch. Uh, we're not going to be perfect. We just won't. Uh, let's not set such a high standard for ourselves that we get frozen in our tracks because sometimes just skipping along holding some hands uh, does wondrous good uh, even if we're not that high hurdler. 
Yeah, let's share what we know. That's what I'm trying to do with you. I hope that it's been interesting, at least, if not um, enlightening in some way. And let's share what has worked because, because just, because just one more, one more success is huge. And this is the starfish story that you and I both know. But if you don't know it, uh, the reason you and I are doing this, um, we can use the uh, starfish story that I'll display for you right here. And you can pause your video and read that. And if you're not familiar with it, it's just a wonderful little short anecdote. And so that is kind of what I got. And I'm so appreciative uh, that you gave me a chance to share what I know and what I've experienced. And I know that many of you are uh, much more deeply expert in this than am I. Uh, but I learned from trying to share with you. So be good to yourself and let's go put a starfish in the ocean. Signing off, this is Honeycutt.